Chapter Twenty Seven. One evening, Victorin Hulot, seeing his father retire for the night, said to his mother, "Well, we are at any rate so far happy that my father has come back to us. My wife and I shall never regret our capital if only this lasts." "Your father is nearly seventy," said the Baroness. "He still thinks of Madame Marneffe, that I can see, but he will forget her in time." a passion for women is not like gambling or speculation or avarice there is an end to it but adeline still beautiful in spite of her fifty years and her sorrows in this was mistaken profligates men whom nature has gifted with the precious power of loving beyond the limits ordinarily set to love rarely are as old as their age during this relapse into virtue Baron Hulot had been three times to the Rue du Dauphin, and had certainly not been the man of seventy. His rekindled passion made him young again, and he would have sacrificed his honour to Valerie, his family, his all, without a regret. But Valerie, now completely altered, never mentioned money, not even the twelve hundred francs a year to be settled on their son. On the contrary, she offered him money she loved hulot as a woman of six-and-thirty loves a handsome law student a poor poetical ardent boy and the hapless wife fancied she had reconquered her dear hector the fourth meeting between this couple had been agreed upon at the end of the third exactly as formerly in italian theatres the play was announced for the next night the hour fixed was nine in the morning on the next day when the happiness was due for which the amorous old man had resigned himself to domestic rules at about eight in the morning wren came and asked to see the baron hulot fearing some catastrophe went out to speak with wren who would not come into the anteroom the faithful waiting-maid gave him the following note dear old man do not go to the rue du dauphin our incubus is ill and i must nurse him but be there this evening at nine crevel is at corbeil with monsieur le bas so i am sure he will bring no princess to his little palace i have made arrangements here to be free for the night and get back before marneffe is awake answer me as to all this for perhaps your long elegy of a wife no longer allows you your liberty as she did i am told she is still so handsome that you might play me false you are such a gay dog burn this note i am suspicious of every one hulot wrote this scrap in reply my love as i have told you my wife has not for five-and-twenty years interfered with my pleasures for you i would give up a hundred adelines i will be in the crevel sanctum at nine this evening awaiting my divinity oh that your clerk might soon die we should part no more and this is the dearest wish of your Hector. That evening the Baron told his wife that he had business with the minister at St. Cloud, that he would come home at about four or five in the morning, and he went to the Rue de Dauphin. It was towards the end of the month of June. Few men have in the course of their life known really the dreadful sensation of going to their death those who have returned from the foot of the scaffold may be easily counted but some have had a vivid experience of it in dreams they have gone through it all to the sensation of the knife at their throat at the moment when waking and daylight come to release them well the sensation to which the councillor of state was a victim at five in the morning in crevel's handsome and elegant bed was immeasurably worse than that of feeling himself bound to the fatal block in the presence of ten thousand spectators looking at you with twenty thousand sparks of fire valerie was asleep in a graceful attitude she was lovely as a woman is who is lovely enough to look so even in sleep it is art invading nature in short a living picture in his horizontal position the baron's eyes were but three feet above the floor his gaze wandering idly as that of a man who is just awake and collecting his ideas fell on a door painted with flowers by jean an artist disdainful of fame the baron did not indeed see twenty thousand flaming eyes 
like the man condemned to death, he saw but one, of which the shaft was really more piercing than the thousands on the public square. Now this sensation, far rarer in the midst of enjoyment even than that of a man condemned to death, was one for which many a splenetic Englishman would certainly pay a high price. The baron lay there, horizontal still, and literally bathed in cold sweat. He tried to doubt the fact, but this murderous eye had a voice. A sound of whispering was heard through the door. "'So long as it is nobody but Crevel playing a trick on me,' said the baron to himself, only too certain of an intruder in the temple. The door was opened. The majesty of the French law, which in all documents follows next to the king, became visible in the person of a worthy little police officer, supported by a tall justice of the peace, both shown in by Monsieur Marneffe. The police functionary, rooted in shoes of which the straps were tied together with flapping bows, ended at top in a yellow skull almost bare of hair, and a face betraying him as a wide-awake, cheerful, and cunning dog, from whom Paris life had no secrets. His eyes, though garnished with spectacles, pierced the glasses with a keen mocking glance. The justice of the peace, a retired attorney and an old admirer of the fair sex, envied the delinquent. "'Pray excuse the strong measures required by our office, Monsieur le Baron,' said the constable. "'We are acting for the plaintiff. The justice of the peace is here to authorize the visitation of the premises. I know who you are, and who the lady is who is accused.' Valérie opened her astonished eyes, gave such a shriek as actresses use to depict madness on the stage, writhed in convulsions on the bed, like a witch of the Middle Ages in her sulphur-coloured frock on a bed of faggots. "'Death, and I am ready! My dear Hector, but a police court? Oh, never!' With one bound she passed the three spectators and crouched under the little writing-table, hiding her face in her hands. "'Ruin! Death!' she cried. Monsieur, said Marneffe to Hulot, if Madame Marneffe goes mad, you are worse than a profligate. You will be a murderer. What can a man do? What can he say when he is discovered in a bed which is not his, even on the score of hiring, with a woman who is no more his than the bed is? Well, this. Monsieur the Justice of the Peace, Monsieur the Police Officer, said the baron with some dignity be good enough to take proper care of that unhappy woman whose reason seems to me to be in danger you can harangue me afterwards the doors are locked no doubt you need not fear that she will get away or i either seeing the costume we wear the two functionaries bowed to the magnate's injunctions you come here miserable cur said hulot in a low voice to marneffe taking him by the arm and drawing him closer it is not i but you who will be the murderer you want to be head clerk of your room and officer of the legion of honour that in the first place chief replied marneffe with a bow you shall be all that only soothe your wife and dismiss these fellows nay nay said marneffe knowingly these gentlemen must draw up their report as eye-witnesses to the fact. Without that, the chief evidence in my case, where should I be? The higher official ranks are choke-full of rascalities. You have done me out of my wife, and you have not promoted me, Monsieur le Baron. I give you only two days to get out of the scrape. Here are some letters. Some letters? interrupted Hulot. Yes, letters which prove that you are the father of the child my wife expects to give birth to. You understand? And you ought to settle on my son a sum equal to what he will lose through this bastard. But I will be reasonable. This does not distress me. I have no mania for paternity myself. A hundred louis a year will satisfy me. By to-morrow I must be Monsieur Coquet's successor, and see my name on the list for promotion in the Legion of Honour at the July fetes, or else the documentary evidence and my charge against you will be laid before the bench. 
I am not so hard to deal with, after all, you see. Bless me and such a pretty woman, said the justice of the peace to the police constable. What a loss to the world if she should go mad. She is not mad, said the constable sententiously. The police is always the incarnation of scepticism. Monsieur le baron Hulot has been caught by a trick, he added, loud enough for Valerie to hear him. Valerie shot a flash from her eye which would have killed him on the spot if looks could affect the vengeance they express. The police officer smiled. He had laid a snare, and the woman had fallen into it. Marneffe desired his wife to go into the other room and clothe herself decently, for he and the baron had come to an agreement on all points, and Hulot fetched his dressing-gown and came out again. "'Gentlemen,' said he to the two officials, "'I need not impress on you to be secret.' The functionaries bowed. The police officer rapped twice on the door. His clerk came in, sat down at the bonheur du jour, and wrote what the constable dictated to him in an undertone. Valérie still wept vehemently. When she was dressed, Hulot went into the other room and put on his clothes. Meanwhile the report was written. Marneffe then wanted to take his wife home, but Hulot, believing that he saw her for the last time, begged the favor of being allowed to speak with her. Monsieur, your wife has cost me dear enough for me to be allowed to say good-bye to her, in the presence of you all, of course. Valérie went up to Hulot, and he whispered in her ear, There is nothing left for us but to fly, but how can we correspond? We have been betrayed. Through Wren, she answered, but, my dear friend, after this scandal we can never meet again. I am disgraced. Besides, you will hear dreadful things about me. You will believe them. The baron made a gesture of denial. You will believe them, and I can thank God for that, for then perhaps you will not regret me. He will not die a second-class clerk, said Marneffe to Hulot, as he led his wife away, saying roughly, Come, madame, if I am foolish to you, I do not choose to be a fool to others. Valerie left the house, Crevel's Eden, with a last glance at the baron, so cunning that he thought she adored him. The justice of the peace gave Madame Marneffe his arm to the hackney coach with a flourish of gallantry. The baron, who was required to witness the report, remained quite bewildered, alone with the police officer. When the baron had signed, the officer looked at him keenly over his glasses. "'You are very sweet on the little lady, Monsieur le baron.' to my sorrow, as you see. Suppose that she does not care for you, the man went on, that she is deceiving you. I have long known that, monsieur, here in this very spot, monsieur Crevel and I told each other. Oh, then you knew that you were in monsieur le maire's private snuggery. Perfectly. The constable lightly touched his hat with a respectful gesture. You are very much in love, said he. I say no more. I respect an inveterate passion, as a doctor respects an inveterate complaint. I saw Monsieur de Nucingen, the banker, attacked in the same way. He is a friend of mine, said the baron. Many a time have I supped with his handsome Esther. She was worth the two million francs she cost him. And more, said the officer. That caprice of the old baron's cost four persons their lives. Oh, such passions as these are like the cholera. What had you to say to me? asked the baron, who took this indirect warning very ill. Oh, why should I deprive you of your illusions? replied the officer. Men rarely have any left at your age. Rid me of them, cried the counsellor. You will curse the physician later, replied the officer, smiling. I beg of you, monsieur. Well, then, that woman was in collusion with her husband. Oh! Yes, sir, and so it is in two cases out of every ten. Oh, we know it well. What proof have you of such a conspiracy? In the first place, the husband— said the other with the calm acumen of a surgeon practised in unbinding wounds mean speculation is stamped in every line of that villainous face 
but you no doubt set great store by a certain letter written by that woman with regard to the child so much so that i always have it about me replied hulot feeling in his breast pocket for the little pocket-book which he always kept there leave your pocket-book where it is said the man as crushing as a thunderclap here is the letter i now know all i want to know madame marneffe of course was aware of what that pocket-book contained she alone in the world so i supposed now for the proof you asked for of her collusion with her husband let us hear said the baron still incredulous when we came in here monsieur le baron that wretched creature marneffe led the way and he took up this letter which his wife no doubt had placed on this writing-table and he pointed to the bonheur du jour that evidently was the spot agreed upon by the couple in case she should succeed in stealing the letter while you were asleep for this letter as written to you by the lady is combined with those you wrote to her decisive evidence in a police court he showed hulot the note that wren had delivered to him in his private room at the office it is one of the documents in the case said the police agent return it to me monsieur well monsieur replied hulot with bitter expression that woman is profligacy itself in fixed ratios i am certain at this moment that she has three lovers that is perfectly evident said the officer oh they are not all on the streets when a woman follows that trade in a carriage and a drawing-room and her own house it is not a case for francs and centimes monsieur le baron mademoiselle esther of whom you spoke and who poisoned herself made away with millions if you will take my advice you will get out of it monsieur this last little game will have cost you dear that scoundrel of a husband has the law on his side and indeed but for me that little woman would have caught you again thank you monsieur said the baron trying to maintain his dignity now we will lock up the farce is played out and you can send your key to monsieur the mayor hulot went home in a state of dejection bordering on helplessness and sunk in the gloomiest thoughts he woke his noble and saintly wife and poured into her heart the history of the past three years sobbing like a child deprived of a toy this confession from an old man young in feeling this frightful and heart-rending narrative while it filled adeline with pity also gave her the greatest joy she thanked heaven for this last catastrophe for in fancy she saw the husband settled at last in the bosom of his family lisbeth was right said madame hulot gently and without any useless recrimination she told us how it would be yes if only i had listened to her instead of flying into a rage that day when i wanted poor hortense to go home rather than compromise the reputation of that oh my dear adeline we must save wenceslas he is up to his chin in that mire my poor old man the respectable middle classes have turned out no better than the actresses said adeline with a smile the baroness was alarmed at the change in her hector when she saw him so unhappy ailing crushed under his weight of woes she was all heart all pity all love she would have shed her blood to make hulot happy stay with us my dear hector tell me what it is that such women do to attract you so powerfully i too will try why have you not taught me to be what you want am i deficient in intelligence men still think me handsome enough to court my favor many a married woman attached to her duty and to her husband may here pause to ask herself why strong and affectionate men so tender-hearted to the madame marneffes do not take their wives for the object of their fancies and passions especially wives like the baronne adeline hulot this is indeed one of the most recondite mysteries of human nature love which is debauch of reason the strong and austere joy of a lofty soul and pleasure 
the vulgar counterfeit sold in the market-place are two aspects of the same thing the woman who can satisfy both these devouring appetites is as rare in her sex as a great general a great writer a great artist a great inventor in a nation a man of superior intellect or an idiot an hulot or a crevel equally crave for the ideal and for enjoyment all alike go in search of the mysterious compound so rare that at last it is usually found to be a work in two volumes this craving is a depraved impulse due to society marriage no doubt must be accepted as a tie it is life with its duties and its stern sacrifices on both parts equally libertines who seek for hidden treasure are as guilty as other evil-doers who are more hardly dealt with than they these reflections are not a mere veneer of moralizing they show the reason of many unexplained misfortunes but indeed this drama points its own moral or morals for they are of many kinds the baron presently went to call on the marshal prince de wissembourg whose powerful patronage was now his only chance having dwelt under his protection for five-and-thirty years he was a visitor at all hours and would be admitted to his rooms as soon as he was up ah how are you my dear hector said the great and worthy leader what is the matter you look anxious and yet the session is ended one more over i speak of that now as i used to speak of a campaign and indeed i believe the newspapers nowadays speak of the sessions as parliamentary campaigns we have been in difficulties i must confess marshal but the times are hard said hulot it cannot be helped the world was made so every phase has its own drawbacks the worst misfortune in the year eighteen forty one is that neither the king nor the ministers are free to act as napoleon was the marshal gave hulot one of those eagle flashes which in its pride clearness and perspicacity showed that in spite of years that lofty soul was still upright and vigorous you want me to do something for you said he in a hearty tone i find myself under the necessity of applying to you for the promotion of one of my second clerks to the head of a room as a personal favor to myself and his advancement to be officer of the legion of honor what is his name said the marshal with a look like a lightning flash marneffe he has a pretty wife i saw her on the occasion of your daughter's marriage if roger but roger is away hector my boy this is concerned with your pleasures what you still indulge well you are a credit to the old guard that is what comes of having been in the commissariat you have reserves but have nothing to do with this little job my dear boy it is too strong of the petticoat to be good business no marshal it is bad business for the police courts have a finger in it would you like to see me go there the devil said the prince uneasily go on well i am in the predicament of a trapped fox you have always been so kind to me that you will i am sure condescend to help me out of the shameful position in which i am placed hulot related his misadventures as wittily and as lightly as he could and you prince will you allow my brother to die of grief a man you love so well or leave one of your staff in the war office a councillor of state to live in disgrace this marneffe is a wretched creature he can be shelved in two or three years how you talk of two or three years my dear fellow said the marshal but prince the imperial guard is immortal i am the last of the first batch of marshals said the prince listen hector you do not know the extent of my attachment to you you shall see on the day when i retire from office we will go together but you are not a deputy my friend many men want your place but for me you would be out of it by this time 
yes i have fought many a pitched battle to keep you in it well i grant you your two requests it would be too bad to see you riding the bar at your age and in the position you hold but you stretch your credit a little too far if this appointment gives rise to discussion we shall not be held blameless i can laugh at such things but you will find it a thorn under your feet and the next session will see your dismissal your place is held out as a bait to five or six influential men and you have been enabled to keep it solely by the force of my arguments i tell you on the day when you retire there will be five malcontents to one happy man whereas by keeping you hanging on by a thread for two or three years we shall secure all six votes there was a great laugh at the council meeting the veteran of the old guard as they say was becoming desperately wide awake in parliamentary tactics i am frank with you and you are growing gray you are a happy man to be able to get into such difficulties as these how long is it since i lieutenant cotin had a mistress he rang the bell that police report must be destroyed he added monseigneur you are as a father to me i dared not mention my anxiety on that point i still wish i had roger here cried the prince as mitoufle his groom of the chambers came in i was just going to send for him you may go mitoufle go you my dear old fellow go and have the nomination made out i will sign it at the same time that low schemer will not long enjoy the fruit of his crimes he will be sharply watched and drummed out of the regiment for the smallest fault you are saved this time my dear hector take care for the future do not exhaust your friend's patience you shall have the nomination this morning and your man shall get his promotion in the legion of honor how old are you now within three months of seventy what a scapegrace said the prince laughing it is you who deserve a promotion but by thunder we are not under louis the fifteenth such is the sense of comradeship that binds the glorious survivors of the napoleonic phalanx that they always feel as if they were in camp together and bound to stand together through thick and thin one more favor such as this hulot reflected as he crossed the courtyard and i am done for the luckless official went to baron de nucingen to whom he now owed a mere trifle and succeeded in borrowing forty thousand francs on his salary pledged for two years more the banker stipulated that in the event of hulot's retirement on his pension the whole of it should be devoted to the repayment of the sum borrowed till the capital and interest were all cleared off this new bargain like the first was made in the name of Vauvinet, to whom the baron signed notes of hand to the amount of twelve thousand francs on the following day the fateful police report the husband's charge the letters all the papers were destroyed the scandalous promotion of monsieur marneffe hardly heeded in the midst of the july fetes was not commented on in any newspaper